is HDR session. We would like to get started. All right. Um, as we create, whoa, as we create more content in HDR, it is becoming very, very important for us to understand what or how does the dynamic range, the brighter pixels, the shadows in the dark, and also the wide color gamut, the larger palette, um, how it influences our images, both in quality and in creative intent. Uh, in this session, we will introduce you the three studies to address those questions. Uh, first, a study on methodologies for measuring the quality of HDR images. Uh, second, a study on implication of HDR and white color gamut uh, on a human perception. And finally, third, a study on an approach to enhance the quality of HDR images. Um, I am Sally Hattori from 20th Century Fox. I will be facilitating the session today with Eric Gazelle uh, from Dolby sitting in the front row. Um, please hold your questions until the end of each presentation. We are expected to have the Q&A session uh, at the end of each presentation. Uh, thank you. So let's dive into the first session. Um, our first presentation is on HDR and white color gamut image quality assessment using color difference matrix from Dr. Anustab Chatori and Ms. Jacqueline Pitlars. Um, Dr. Anustab Chatori is a senior researcher at Dolby Laboratory Applied Vision Science Group. His research interests include image video analysis and processing, pattern recognition, computer vision, computational photography, and machine learning. His work has been published in various conferences and journals and having received special recognition. He received the PhD and master's degrees in computer science from USC. Uh, Ms. Jacqueline Pitlars is a staff researcher at Dolby Laboratories Applied Vision Science Group. Her research includes vision science surrounding technologies for HDR and white color gamut displays. Her focus is developing a color mapping and display management algorithms to help maintain the consistent imagery on a wide variety of displays. She holds bachelor's degrees in motion picture science from RIT and is currently pursuing her master's degrees in computational and mathematical engineering at Stanford University. Uh, please welcome uh, Dr. Tatori and uh, Ms. Pitlars. Hello, everyone. It's nice to see you all. I want to start out by just clarifying what we mean by high dynamic range and wide color gamut. Essentially, if this was an SDR image, an example of what an HDR image would do would look something like this. So we're not necessarily talking about a brighter image. We're talking about more detail in the highlights and shadows, more detail in the color saturation. For high dynamic range wide color gamma images, images may be intentionally degraded. This might be because of bandwidth limitations for chroma subsampling, compression, bit depth, and it might be because of compatibility. Maybe we've done some tone mapping. Maybe we've done some gamut mapping. What you might not have noticed is that I've been changing this image throughout the time. And in reality, it's those small changes over a long period of time that can result in a very large change. And color difference metrics can be used to quantify this amount of subjective change. And that's what we're going to be talking about here today. Typically, color difference metrics were analyzed using something like this, color patches. For high dynamic range and standard dynamic range, this assessment has been done many, many times. But for high dynamic range and wide color gamut, this hasn't really been done for natural imagery. That's what we'll be focusing on today with publicly available databases. The color difference metrics that we'll be looking at are the ones listed here. We'll start with two metrics that are defined by CIE, and these are both based on the LAB color space. We'll also be looking at two more state-of-the-art high dynamic range models for measuring color differences. And I'll start by describing a little bit about these color difference metrics and the spaces that they're involved in, starting with CIE LAB. LAB was designed to be perceptually uniform. 
It was calculated from XYZ tristimulus values. And what I really want you to focus on here is that XN, YN, and ZN, because that'll be the key to our analysis later on. What these are is the normalizing factors for the adapting white point. Essentially what that means is that in the model, you have to specify, I am adapted to 100 nit D65. So you have to know that constant steady adaptation state. One of the first metrics for based in CAE LAB was called delta EAB. And this was just simple Euclidean distance. If LAB was perfectly perceptually uniform, this metric would have worked. However, later developments have been made, been significantly improved upon, so we're not going to analyze this one here. But I have the equation up there just for reference as I move on to delta E94. The equation on the right is just there for reference so that you can see it build up over the years. Um, this one improves the uniformity using RIT DuPont paint data. Essentially, up until this point, most of the data used to optimize these, optimize these models is based on experiments done with paint samples and color differences as it related to a reflective medium. Then delta E2000, we see the equation getting a little bit longer. This further improved the uniformity. We're talking about some hue rotations, compensation for lightness. But essentially, what these metrics are doing over time is improving the perceptual uniformity through a bunch of mathematical operations. So we can see from the amount of adjustments that they've done that CAELAB as a base wasn't perceptually uniform. And I want to go back to talking about that XN and YN and ZN that's required for both of those metrics I just talked about. Now, how are you supposed to know the adapting white point of complex imagery and video? We see the content changing and adapting over time. And the fact is, you don't. So what do people do? Common practice, well, let's start by using D65. For SDR, we would choose the peak of the display. We'd choose 100 candelas per meter squared. Now what do we do for HDR? Well, we could use the peak of the display. Could we use 4,000? Could we use 1,000? Or fairly common practice is to actually use the same luminance as we did for standard dynamic range, mostly because it relates closer to the average picture level of an HDR image, so 100 candelas per meter squared. What we'll do in this talk for delta E2000 is we'll analyze both of these options. So you'll see later on there's a DE2100 and a DE2001000. And those are the two different options for our adapting white point. Moving on to our HDR metrics, why are we looking at something new in the first place? As I just showed, C-Lab is known to be non-uniform based on those equations having developed it over the years. The published reference conditions for delta E2000 actually exclude typical high dynamic range. It also wasn't optimized for high dynamic range. As I said before, this was mostly done on paint sample data and meant more so for a reflective medium. And lastly, for video analysis, the state of adaptation may be unknown or variable. You might have two people looking at different areas of the screen. The screen might be large. You don't know where someone is looking at any point in time. So these are the reasons that we started looking at some new, specifically made for high dynamic range wide color gamut metrics. We'll start by looking at the JZAZBZ space. This one uses XYZ, as we saw with LAB, but it goes into the LMS cone fundamental space. Um, they've optimized this matrix based on hue linearity and perceptual data. But what I want to focus on here is actually that middle one, where they're going from linear and they're using the PQ or perceptual quantizer curve. It's not exactly the ST2084 curve because they have convert this to relative. Essentially, they took a data set that had lightness data and they normalized the PQ based on that. But focusing on this last bullet point, that lightness data that they used was based on having a surround of 1,000 candelas per meter squared. And that'll come into play later on. The actual color difference metric is called delta EZ. 
and this is based in polar coordinates in the JZAZBZ space. If it's perceptually uniform, Euclidean distance should work just fine. Now, moving on to our last and final metric, it's based in the ICTCP color space. This also starts from XYZ and goes into an LMS cone fundamental space, um, but this uses more of a standardized Hunt Pointer Estevez space, um, also modified for some Q linearity data. This uses the PQ curve as well and has been standardized in I2R BT2100. This was specifically designed for improved hue linearity, perceptual uniformity, and also encoding of high dynamic range wide color gamma imagery. The color difference metric is Euclidean distance scaled by 720 just so that a value of one means your visual threshold. So again, to recap a little bit, delta E94 and delta E2000 have that user-defined static adaptation. Do we pick D65, 100, 1,000? Now, delta EZ kind of used this, this baked static adaptation because it had that lightness data based on 997 candelas per meter squared. And I haven't really covered delta EITP, but essentially this has a floating critical adaptation. And I want to show you a little bit about what that means. Before we play the DCP, I want to explain a little bit about what you're going to see. What's going to happen is on screen, it's going to have you adapt to a particular color for 30 seconds. Then four squares are going to pop up on the screen. Over time, one of those squares is going to start to deviate from the other three. It's going to get more and more different over time. And what I want you to do is look at those four squares, and as soon as you can tell which one is different from the other three, look in the bottom left corner and you'll see a time. Then I'm going to do it under a different adaptation state. You do the same thing, and we'll see what the difference is under a critical versus non-critical adaptation state. So go ahead and play that DCP, and let's see how it goes. So we'll start with a D65 adaptation. So keep staring at that screen so that your eyes have time to adapt to that D65 color. And in a minute, those, three, those four squares are going to pop up. One of them will slowly get more and more different from the other three. And as soon as you've seen it, look in the bottom left corner at that time. OK. What we're going to do next is I'm going to go to an adaptation state that's very similar to the color we just looked at. So this is a critical high adaptation state. So everyone look at that yellow. And in a minute, those four squares are going to pop up again. The different square may or may not be in the same location. So these are the same four squares that we saw before. As soon as you see it, look in the bottom left. And if we go back to the presentation now, so by a raise of hands, how many saw it faster the second time? Wonderful. That looks like high majority. So essentially what that demo is trying to show is that your threshold of adaptation, so how different those colors have to be, is much smaller when you're under this critical state of adaptation. And remember that delta E2000, we had to put in what our adaptation was. So we had to pick what we were adapted to. But when you're talking about moving imagery, do you really know what you're adapted to at any point in time? So all of this will come into play. And Anna Stoop is going to take us through all the databases and analysis that we did. So take it away. Thank you. So in order to evaluate these color difference metrics that we looked at so far, we used five publicly available HDR and white color gamma databases comprising of natural images. So the authors of these databases provided the reference and the distorted image 
along with the subjective ratings for those images. And let's go through those databases. So the first database contained 20 reference HDR images shown on the right. Each of these images were compressed with JPEG XT using three different profiles at four different bit rates. So there were 12 distortions for every reference image, resulting in a total of 240 distorted images. Here is an illustration from that database. So this is the original image, and this is the distorted image. And you can see the level of distortion these databases had. So the second database contained 10 reference HDR images. Half of them were tone mapped and compressed using three different compression schemes, and the other half were tone mapped using two other algorithms and compressed using two of those compression schemes. So each of the image were uh, un undergo through 10 different types of distortions, resulting in a total of 100 distorted images. So here is an illustration from that database, where this is the original image, and this is the distorted image. Note that, note that these distortions are quite severe, but it's not true that all these images in the database are as distorted. They have a wide range of distortions. So we'll have an illustration to show that, where we have this original reference HDR image, and we will focus on this hot air balloon. That balloon is shown there on the far left, and this is distortion with the, showing the best quality, so effectively having the least amount of distortion. And you can see that it's hard to find difference between the reference and the distorted image. And progressively, the distortion keeps on increasing towards the right. And on the top rightmost image, you can see heavy distortions around the sun. And also, you can see some ringing or mosquito noise artifacts around the hot air balloon. And on the bottom, you can see some contouring artifacts around the, around the clouds. So these are the kind of distortions that they have, and they span a wide range of distortions. The third database that we considered also contained 10 reference HDR images. So these went through some other types of distortions. So effectively, they had 14 different distortions for every image, resulting in a total of 140 distorted images. So a couple of things about this database and the analysis was that the subjective study for this database was conducted in a high ambient environment of around 130 candelas per meter square, or 130 nits. And the other thing was that the subjective analysis was done without any reference. Here is an illustration from that database, where this is the original image, and this is the distorted image. So some of the limitations of these databases were that they did not explore wider color gamut. All the images were, under, were within the Rec. 709 color gamut. Also, they did not specifically contain any color artifacts. And the subjective testing was conducted on only one type of display. All of them were conducted on a SIM2 HDR monitor. So to expand the scope of our analysis, we tested on two additional databases which included images beyond the Rec. 709 color gamuts, specifically P3 images that were present in the BT2020 or 2100 color gamut. They also specifically included chromatic distortions, and the subjective testing was conducted on a different type of display, a Sony BVM-X300 OLED monitor, which had a lower black level than the SIM2 HDR monitor. Now let's go through those two databases. So the first of those databases contained eight reference HDR images shown here on the right. And they were distorted using a couple of HEVC compression techniques, one of them specifically to introduce chromatic artifacts. And they also had Gaussian noise and gamut mismatch artifacts. I'll go through those examples here. So here are three different examples of reference images. And here are the distorted images. And I'll toggle between those two. So on the leftmost image, on the leftmost image, you can see the Gaussian noise artifacts. On the middle image, you can see the HEVC compression artifacts. And on the rightmost image, you can see the distortion resulted due to gamut mismatch. So the gamut mismatch was done in such a way that, let's say you have rendered a BT709 image, and you interpret that as a BT2020 image, resulting in a more saturated look. The last database that we considered also contained eight reference HDR images, 
and these were also 4K images. And these images were also distorted using three different HEVC compression techniques at four different quality parameters. So there were 12 distortions present for every image, resulting in a total of 96 distorted images for this database. So now we have taken a look at the databases, understood the type of distortions they have and the range of distortions that they have. Now let me explain the experimental, oh, so before that, so the, here is an illustration of that. So this is the original image and the distorted image. So the experimental paradigm that we had is as follows. So we evaluated the performance by comparing the MOS or the mean opinion score obtained from the subjective study which were provided by the authors of the databases with the predicted scores using these color difference metrics. So mean opinion score stand is measure of subjective quality. So it is typically expressed as a single integer number, maybe ranging from one to five, where five stands for the highest quality perceived quality and one stands for the lowest perceived quality. The next thing that we did was to fit a monotonic logistic function to fit the objective prediction to these subjective scores. So this technique is standardized in the video quality experts group and it is typically done to mimic the fact that high level cognitive processes are required to map the low level perceptions to an actual score given by people. And once we fit this function, we evaluated these models using four different performance indicators. So in the interest of time, we will just talk about one of them, the Spearman Rank Order Correlation Coefficient or SROCC. And we found out that the trends across all these models, performance indicators were similar. So we need not have to repeat the analysis for all the other performance indicators. Now here are the results. So on the x-axis over here, we have the databases and on the y-axis, we have presented the SROCC or the Spearman rank order correlation coefficient values. Note that a higher value is better. And in blue, we have shown the values using delta E 2000 at an adapting white point of 100 nits. Next in green, we have shown the performance using delta E 2000 at an adapting white point of 1000 nits. And the observations that we have here are that delta E 2000 at an adapting white point of 100 nits performs better than delta E 2000 at an adapting white point of 1000 nits. And the reasons for that are as follows. So the observers were not likely actually adapted to 1000 nits. And this is also expected because typical average luminance level of HDR imagery is closer to 100 nits. Next, in magenta, we plot the scores using delta E94 at an adapting white point of 100 nits. And we can't really draw any specific conclusions using this one. Now, in black, we plot the scores using delta EZ, which was a metric that was designed for high dynamic range and white color gamut applications. And in red, we show the results using delta E ITP. Now let's go through these observations again. So we found out that overall delta E ITP outperforms delta E 2000 and delta EZ on four out of five databases. The only database where it did not outperform is database three, and we will go through that analysis later why that was the case. We also observed that delta E ITP outperforms delta E94 on all the databases. And the reason for that is that the achromatic nonlinearity of delta E ITP is known to better match the human visual threshold for HDR luminance range. We also observe that database one seems less selective since most metrics have a really high correlation on an average as compared to the other databases. On the other hand, we found out that the overall performance of all metrics is poorer on database four. And we believe that is the case because database four has a wide variety of artifacts. And some of the artifacts such as gamut mismatch might be clearly visible 
but not really associated with quality loss. So here is an example to show that which I had also shown earlier, where on the left we have the original reference image and on the right we have an image distorted by gamut mismatch. It has a more saturated look, but you don't really know what quality to give it as compared to the reference image. The next observation that we had for this database for across all the databases are that delta EZ which was specifically designed for high dynamic range and white color gamut frequently performed poorly across all the databases. And the reason being that the offset blue linearity correction that is present in the JZ, AZ, BZ color space could potentially cause a mismatch. Also the equations of JZ, AZ, BZ were optimized using a database which had a diffuse white point of closer to 1000 nits. And we had already mentioned earlier why that might not be an ideal scenario. Now database three was a challenge for Delta E ITP and the reasons for that could be twofold. One of them was that during the subjective analysis, there was no reference image that was present. So to give a score could have been harder. The other thing was that the evaluation was not conducted in a dark surround. It had a bright ambient of around 130 candela per meter square, whereas typically subjective analysis is done in a relatively dark environment. The other thing is that Delta E ITP is designed for the most critical conditions. So in that, if for designing of Delta E ITP, you assume that the display has the largest physical dynamic range possible with no black level elevations that could happen potentially due to screen reflections especially which occurs in a bright ambient environment. And how do we solve that? We could adapt not only delta E ITP, but potentially also the other color difference metrics to adapt to the ambient illumination conditions. So now we have taken a look at all these color difference metrics, but to truly understand the benefits, we perform statistical analysis on these metrics. So in order to do that, we uh, performed a z-test using Fisher z-transformation. And here are the results on database one. So on the left, we have shown the SROCC values for each of the color different metrics on database one. And using a red rectangle, we have shown the best performing metric. And on the right, we have the indicators. So if a cell is gray in color in this table, then it means that the row metric is statistically equivalent to the column metric. If a cell is green in color, then the row metric is statistically significantly superior to the column metric. And if a cell is red in color, then the row metric is statistically significantly inferior to the column metric. And for database one, we found out that delta EZ is statistically inferior to delta E2000 and delta E94 and delta E ITP is statistically significantly better than delta EZ. All the other color difference metrics are statistically equivalent to each other. On database two, we found out that delta E ITP is statistically significantly superior to, to the other color difference metrics and the other color difference metrics amongst themselves are statistically equivalent to each other. On database three, where delta E to 2000 was the best performing metric, we found out that all the metrics are statistically equivalent to each other. Likewise on database four, all the metrics are statistically equivalent to each other, although delta E ITP was the best performing one. And finally on database five, we found out that delta E ITP is statistically significantly superior to the other color difference metrics. So to conclude, we evaluated four different color difference metrics, delta E2000, delta E94, delta EZ, and delta E ITP on five different publicly available databases, which are wide color gamut and high dynamic range, and they have a wide range and a wide variety of distortion artifacts. We found out that delta E ITP outperforms the other color difference metrics on four out of those five databases. And as for future work, we would want to do more advanced modeling to, to specifically account for, say, let's say, the ambient viewing conditions that was present in database three. And in database four, there was a wide variety of artifacts 
and these color difference metrics, which typically work on a pixel by pixel basis, do not work well. So we'd want to take into account spatiochromatic models. So with that, we conclude our talk, and I think we have time for some questions. Thank you. Hi, uh, Winston Caldwell with Fox. Um, so that was a uh, interesting, very interesting presentation. Uh, thank you very much. W uh, the thought I had is, and perhaps you've tried it, but to take all the images and all the d databases, put them together, mm -hmm. right, and maybe separate them by um, by the different distortions and the different compression algorithms, and then try these different delta E metrics on, on those sets. I, I wonder if you've thought about maybe doing that way, because then you would have, you know, a, a single set would have many more different images, mm -hmm. right? So I, I just wonder if you had any thoughts about that. So we have not tried doing that, but one potential problem is that we obtain these databases from different authors who had different scales and potentially different ratings. So there has been some work in trying to align the mean opinion scores of these different databases. So you introduce additional variability to the system, but it is something that we could consider doing. Uh, one minute, one more question. Yeah. Can I ask two? The first one's really simple. Sure. I, just, sure. I think I just missed it. Was the delta E for an image just the, at, the mean of delta E at every pixel? Correct. Yeah. yeah. And so at the end, you mentioned, OK, there's obviously more complex things going on here, like using a spatiochromatic model would make sense. Since a lot of your um, color difference metrics were equivalent statistically, do you think once you included some spatial processing in there that all of a sudden that might highlight differences between the color metrics? Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm where all of a sudden one might become more valuable than the other if you had some yeah. spatial processing in there? Yeah, that's a possibility, and we are currently looking into okay. that right now. 